A debt crisis is looming in Africa. Many more countries on the continent are unable to meet debt obligations owing to the prevalence of exogenous factors, which continue to cripple developing countries around the world. First, it was COVID-19, and now it's the escalation of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis, which is causing disruptions even to food supply chains. There are indications that approximately 40% of sub-Saharan African countries are at risk of debt distress, prompting calls for an urgent action at the multilateral level. Developed nations around the world, including the United States, are reaching out to Africa in order to avert the crisis. President Joe Biden is expected to, uh, in the coming days, uh, host leaders uh, for the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, which will provide increased cooperation on shared global priorities. But is that sufficient for Africa and how can Africa become more self-reliant? Let's speak to Siad Hamoy, a founding member and past regional president of the Borderless Alliance, a regional trade advocacy group. He currently serves as the national president of the group. Siad, welcome to Foreign Affairs. Countries, you can't actually move goods without having goods, for example, roads. But now to invest in roads is a long-term investment. You're expecting some returns on your investment. There is a shop. There is not enough uh, economic development. So you're in a situation where you want to look at developing your continent while dealing with the latest external shock. So how to go forward? That's one of the issues that we are all looking at from various angles. Uh, but then in all of this, uh, the opinions remain divided as to the way forward for Africa. Many are asking us that looking at the trajectory and the situation in which we find ourselves now, we're helpless. Uh, but to go down the lane of seeking for aid or development assistance, which has been the norm over the years, some have argued that we need to opt for trade and not just the north-south divide sort of trade, but now let's go into intra-Africa trade. Where do you side in all of these arguments? Well, first of all, the Borderless Alliance as a regional private sector-led advocacy group looks at removing barriers to, to the free movement of goods and people and finance and investment across Africa with the sole purpose of helping accelerate African economic integration and the freedom of the movement of the goods and the people towards the benefit of Africa and the Africans, whether businesses or citizens or governments. So that is where we position ourselves in removing the barriers because African countries need each other. And there are ways where we can go about it. Now, keep in mind that in order to boost intra-African trade, which is where most of the focus is, you cannot do that one without boosting intra-African transport. Because you need to identify where the markets are, and then you need to move your goods from one country to the other. And that is where you start to look at the exp exploring the real challenges that have been hindering African development that have to do with African connectivity. Africa is not well connected to itself, whether it's ports or it's airports or it's roads. You have a huge infrastructure gap. You also have a huge policy gap. For example, you can't just own a vessel in, let's say, Tema, and then sail your vessel, let's say, to Cabo Verde, just because you identify a market for plastic for African, for Ghanaian uh, plastic wear, for example. There is something called the short sea shipping framework that is non-existing at the continental level. In some regions of Africa, it is not existing, for example, in a, a, at a regional economic community level. Now, uh, in order just to simplify things, we need to look at our connectivity by, first of all, examining the type of infrastructure that connects the ports, the cities, and the, and the, and the borders. And then we need to look at the laws and the policies that guide this connectivity. So if, for example, your ports have a certain tariff schedule for, for, for vessels that are calling into your port, and you don't have a way of, for example, factoring smaller barges that carry 50 or 100 or 200 containers, where everybody ends up paying the same amount as a container of 1,000 uh, TEU, for example, it's a container ship of 1,000 TEU pays. So you are, you are hindering the connectivity of this African continent. But, but the deduction so, I'm making from your point is that practically this cannot happen in the short term. So aid is the way to go, correct? Well, 
Look, we are still receiving most of our on onion and livestock from the Sahel, even though the mm. Sahel has uh, threats of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, terrorism and uh, insurgencies and others. So some of the regional trade flows across Africa have not stopped. Actually, the regional trade flows are justified at times of external shocks because it emphasizes the fact that you need to have more resilience, and resilience can only be made by opening up the neighboring countries to each other. And this is something you can do on the shorter term. I'll give you a very quick example. In the middle of the current ongoing crisis that have to do with food security and uh, uh, globally, you would think that, for example, some of the uh, countries in West Africa, like Cote d'Ivoire, will lift off the barriers of moving across its borders. But at the moment, we find ourselves, for example, in a situation where if you move from Ghana towards Cote d'Ivoire through the Nouveau ports, you cannot access Cote d'Ivoire from that side. And so if people cannot move freely, trade cannot move freely. So these are some of the issues that highlight the fact that at the policy level, you need to look at targeting some of the uh, immediate necessities that will free up the movement of your goods and your people across in order to make sure that the basic necessities of people are being met and that the freedom of movement will enable the movement of the goods that are carried by people because goods do not carry themselves. It's people who either carry or drive these goods across. So trade and is so the way to go for you? Trade, trade, yes, trade is a priority. We believe that Africa can become a global trade partner. However, we have to look at some of the real challenges that are preventing the integration process of the various regions and the various countries. Okay, then let's get, let's get to some of the practical measures we're taking. And let me, let me weigh that uh, on your thoughts as well to see whether or not that's the way for the continent. I'll talk about the continental free trade area after. Uh, of course, we all know about it. It's been tagged and touted as the solution to Africa's sluggish growth. Uh, but it's taking too long to take off. Even as we speak, in as much as we have many more countries signing up to the treaty, just seven African countries are starting off, including Ghana, Kenya, and some other uh, surrounding nations. Uh, they are doing not precisely after, but they're doing an after-guided trade. The belief is that the continent is not ready for intra-Africa trade. So... Uh... Again, another complicated question, which I will try to break down into various elements. But I agree with you that the takeoff of the African continental free trade area has not been a smooth one, probably because of a mixture of, uh, of the events, including COVID lockdowns and the difficulty of negotiators to reach an agreement on some fine details in certain areas, like, for example, rules of origin, which uh, currently uh, are at 80 close to 88% completion out of 90%. So the, the, the tiniest details are the ones remaining that needs to be worked out and finalized before we say the African countries have agreed fully on the rules of origin. Now, you remember that the AFCFTA trade was supposed to start officially on the 1st January of 2021. Now, that has been delayed by a year because we were unable to achieve a few elements that were remaining from the negotiation phase one uh, previously. And so it was agreed that the actual real start would be deferred to the 1st January of 2022. And then on the 1st of January 2022, there was still some remaining small details about particularly sensitive value chains of Africa. And so that is where the... Where, where the uh, where the, the, the Council of Ministers have agreed that they are going to start anyway with the percentage and with the number, of, with the agreed rules of origin for countries to start trading with. And when they looked at the uh, party, party states to the AFCFT, currently we have 44 states which, are, which have ratified. When they looked at the levels of advancement in the implementation of the, uh, of the ratification, instrument on the floor, that is on the operations side, on the legal framework, they saw that some countries were more advanced than others with the implementation and with the readiness to move with AFCFT as a trade. Remember, the AFTA will be a complete trade regime. So you have, for example, the ECOWAS trade regime, you have the, you have the World Trade Organization trade regime, you have several trade, and then you have the AFCFT. So some countries are understandably more advanced in uh, implementing and in preparing the frameworks that will allow free to flow than others. 
And that, is, that was the idea behind the guided trade initiative, which currently started with eight pilot countries, including Ghana. And, uh, the, and the objective is to actually try to accelerate and to increase the volumes of trade that are taking place among the countries. If you ask me, I personally still think it's insufficient. There's still a lot of potential to trade among African countries. But at least you have to test it somehow. And the testing has delayed because of some technicalities and because of some politics. Remember that we are in a, in a very complicated world. And if we're talking, for example, of ECOWAS, uh, a region of 15 countries, and the complications of, of ECOWAS for example, with the Togo Benin border, where trucks have been lining up for so many years, and one day, uh, uh, let's say a long time ago, when Nigeria mm. decided to wake up one day and close its borders for certain reasons. Right. And we're just 15 countries, and we're having all of these issues. Mm. So imagine now we have 55 countries, and the level is at continental level. So, and so, so for you, basically, the, the challenges. So competition is political as well. So as basically, the, the challenges are expected. That's what you're saying. And, and you yes, believe that AFTA will stand the test of time? That is a good question, and I, well, I keep saying that the, the, te the truth is in the pudding. I think that the implementation of the AFCFTA will be put to the test the moment the first dispute will come up, and the way we resolve the first dispute between two member states under the AFCFTA will determine eventually sustainability and success rate okay uh, but but even as we speak what's confronting the continent is a debt crisis how do we yes. move out of debt of course we're hearing of the u.s africa summit which is happening in the coming days uh, such corporations have been touted as positive and good for africa what should we be on the lookout for look we live in some extreme in, in some times of extreme inequalities not just on a not just on a country level or on a regional level, but I'm talking at international level, where some countries which, for example, do not require some resource allocation are being allocated much more than they need. On the other hand, other countries are in real need of resources to finance their economic development more sustainably. And maybe I can try to be more straight to the point to say that during uh, last year, for example, during the World Bank meetings, it was agreed that the special drawing rights, which amount to something around 650 billion, beyond that, I, I have to check out the, the exact numbers. And out of that number, Africa as a continent was requesting for a particular amount. And that amount was way that, that they ended up having was way below what was needed. And that's why I was trying to say we are living in some times of extreme inequalities, because the countries which ironically do not need the kind of special drawing rights allocation ended up having much more of that kind of money available for their dispense at much cheaper rates. Imagine countries in Africa which have to uh, borrow at commercial lending rates that vary from 10% all the way to 30% or above. And then you expect economic uh, development based on these sort of terms. What Africa needs at the moment is to is to is access to cheaper concessionary loans on a governmental level, and then based on that, on not only the availability of these loans. And now keep in mind that we are going way beyond the the, the let's let's say the domain of borderless alliance and its advocacy, and we're trying to think aloud about what needs to be done in order to help drive economic uh, development. Uh, across Africa. And so we need to, first of all, negotiate better access to commercial uh, lending to be able to sustain our debts in the longer term. Mm. And at the same time, we need to ensure that these newly acquired uh, resources, in case we manage to successfully get, end up being better managed on the national level and accounted for you know, to make sure that whatever kind of development is also sustainable, mm. not just developing for the sake of right. development. And that brings us back uh, full circle to the start of, the, of this conversation. Mm. Because the countries are rich, but the people are not. Interesting so point. We make sure that, the, that these resources are new to the benefit of those who need it the most. Mm. Ziad, we need to go, uh, but as we wrap up, 
very briefly, what do you see to be the outlook of Africa's economic growth trajectory? Uh, very briefly, uh, even as we wrap up on this conversation. I think we need to focus on African connectivity. And to focus on African connectivity, we need to look at how to become more sustainable in producing some of our strategic needs in order to avoid relying on international global value chains. And this is the latest wake-up call to remember that we need to develop our economies, to add value to our resources, and to make sure that we trade these with our immediate neighbors within the context of the ASEAN. And I'm grateful for your time. Thanks for joining us. Uh, that's uh, Siad Hamui, his national president for the Borderless. Alliance. You're still with us here on Foreign Affairs and uh, still ahead looking up to the US-Africa Trade uh, and Partnership Summit happening and organized by uh, the United States government in Washington, D.C. Uh, ahead of that conference, I've been catching up with the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, asking her about that summit and what President Joe Biden is seeking to realize from the shared global priority. Here's what she had to say. Ambassador Palmer, thank you for talking to Joy News. Thank you so much. You I'm assumed glad to your be here. role uh, as uh, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana this year, so I guess it's in order to say Akwaba. That's our way of saying welcome. How is Ghana treating Madassi. you? <laughs> <laughs> How is Ghana treating you? You know, I've gotten su my my husband and I have gotten such a warm welcome here, and it's it's just a wonderful country. The energy is fantastic. We're looking forward to uh, the U.S.-Africa Summit. Uh, we know that U.S. has a long-standing interest in Africa, but we're just wondering what's inspiring uh, the summit we're about to see this year. What's motivating President Biden to host African leaders in Washington from next week? Well, indeed, Africa is just very important to the United States and to the United States president. And it's a wonderful opportunity to talk about issues of mutual concern, the climate, global security, democracy, and of course, economic progress, and the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and preparation for any other pandemics that might come. And since you're talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, the United Nations Development Program, for instance, is reporting that Africa is facing uh, a double crisis, mm. i.e. the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the latest crisis uh, being created as a result of the Russian-Ukrainian war. How does the U.S. government intend to show up support for African countries that are bearing the shock of those exogenous f factors? Thank you. I would, I would just put one fine point on that, which is it's not the Russia-Ukraine war, it's Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, if, if Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. If Russia stops fighting, the war ends. And indeed, as you point out, the war has ex ex exerted terrible costs on the globe, and particularly Africa, and particularly in food security. Uh, so the United States has stepped up with $5.4 billion in assistance to the World Food Program just this year. Um, we're also working to help um, countries do better agricultural techniques. Um, in Ghana, we're working to help um, farmers use organic fertilizer um, better, for example, because the cost of fertilizer has doubled or tripled in some places. I know the cost of fuel has gone up too, and inflation is being felt all over. So um, we really do really appreciate Ghana's steadfast support in the UN Security Council. Its leadership has been really important in standing up to Russia and saying, no, we're not going to tolerate that kind of bald aggression um, and and reminding everybody i think to pay attention to the problems that this causes in africa uh, and if indeed we're to reassess what's happening now uh, some experts argue that it's exposing how africa lacks resilience mm. uh, what do you think is that major factor inhibiting african countries from building economic resilience Oh, that's, that's a big question. Um, and I mean, I think th the answer is a complicated one. Um, democracy, we believe, is fundamental to transparency and accountability, which is fundamental to getting those things right. Um, it, it is hard when you start from behind the finish line, when, you, when you're already stressed. Um, additional stresses like COVID and, and the, the inflation of fuel prices and food prices that are the result of the Russian invasion then make things worse. So I think building resilience, um, strengthening 
legal regimes, strengthening business environments so that things are done transparently and investments that are made are world class. There's not a race to the bottom and countries are not exploited by foreign investors um, is, is very important to that resilience. Uh, and I'm sure that we'll explore um, the shared priority of democracy shortly because mm. it's one of the uh, key issues that may come up when, when of course, that summit unfolds in um, the U.S. But it, I just, it is, I just, and it's where Ghana is a real yeah, leader. And, and I just want to pick up once more on the economic partnership because we know that uh, the U.S. has been a key supporter of uh, Ghana. You've partnered Ghana in, in so many aspects, especially when it comes to um, supporting our economy. And I just want to go back to uh, one of the activities or announcements that you made earlier this year during the Global Citizens Festival. Mm. Uh, I just want to quote portions of what you said. Uh, you indicated that the United States government will work with Congress to provide 138 million US dollars in new funding to support human capital development in health, education, climate, and peace building. Uh, given Ghana's current economic crisis, how are you working to expedite that? Well, the, the current economic crisis um, requires IMF assistance, I think. That's why those international financial institutions were created. So we've urged the government of Ghana to negotiate with the IMF with urgency, and then as a board member, we'll support those programs. Um, and further to that, um, we work with Ghanaian business and the Ghanaian government to strengthen the business environment so that Ghana lives up to its international reputation. It's important that is problems with contract sanctity, problems with local hiring, um, problems with corruption don't undermine that, if I'm, if I'm honest. And I, th I think friends speak, speak honestly to friends. For the $138 yes, million, dollars, trying to keep me on point. I'm interested um, in that yeah, as well. The, um, I was very pleased mm. um, to be able to announce those additional funding. Um, a lot of that work will focus on agriculture and stimulating um, support for your agriculture sector, because that, again, is an engine for economic growth. Um, and we, we do, again, techniques that improve farming for, for farmers, but we also work with financial institutions, for example, to try to leverage finance for small and medium enterprises in the agriculture and agro-processing sectors. So one of our programs, we think, will unleash something like $270 million of investment in that very important sector. We also work in clean energy. We work to improve Ghana's fishing sec sector, which has been under threat, mm -hmm. I think, um, and um, programs like that. Uh, and some experts were wondering why the U.S. government had, of course, an, made that pledge, knowing that the world over there's an economic recession, mm. and yet you're still uh, finding some time to assist Ghana in terms of our development programs. Well, you know, Ghana is an important partner for the United States, and I think Ghana is really important to West Africa and indeed the rest of Africa getting things right. You're an important exemplar for for other countries in, in Africa to say, if you're democratic, if you d have a clean business environment, um, companies will come in and your economy will prosper. So there are 100 American companies headquartered in Ghana. And I think many of them view Ghana as a gateway into the rest of the continent. Yes, we may be a beacon of democracy, but there's uh, some activities and trends in the sub region mm. uh, that threaten our democratic stability. And I just want to draw your attention to what's happening uh, in neighboring Burkina Faso, uh, th there are fears that um, the upsurge of violent extremism may destabilize the region and relatively mm. stable democracies such as Ghana. What's your take on <coughs> the feeling that democracy is in recession in West Africa and how do we bring it back to life? Yeah, well I think Ghana's leadership frankly in opposing that, that sort of backsliding in the democratic space was incredibly important. And I really am happy to have a chance to publicly salute President Akufo Addo's leadership of ECOWAS um, and trying to keep those countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, on, on track for a democratic transition. Um, and looking at the security situation, and indeed, we all look at Burkina Faso with some trepidation. Um, I also want to salute Ghana's leadership in the Accra Initiative in saying, oh, there's a very serious terrorist threat in the Sahel, and this is in 2017, countries are not paying particular attention to coastal West Africa. So we need to get together to cooperate to ensure our security. And um, that now, particularly as attacks are, are ramping up in Togo and Benin, I think that Accra initiative is getting legs under it. And the United States and other countries are very interested in, in supporting that. Uh, and I recall seeing you there at that summit 
our precedent indicated that if the solution needs to come, it needs to come from the affected countries in right. the sub-region. Right. But the, the feeling is we don't have enough capacity to foil all the threats. Well, sorry, I'm going to back up a couple yeah, times. Right. In, indeed, U.S. support should be by, through, and for Africans, which is why we're so happy to see the Accra Initiative, because it's exactly that. It's African countries and African leaders looking around and saying, oh, the current security architecture isn't answering all the questions, and we need to do our bit. So the president has said, you know, Ghana doesn't need foreign troops in the fight, but he'll accept help to ensure that Ghana's troops are, are fighting most effectively. And I also want to salute Ghana for acknowledging that it isn't only a kinetic fight. Um, in order to really have good security, communities at risk, particularly those communities on the border, need to feel that the state is protecting them. Um, that, so the security forces, the Ghana Armed Forces and the police, who are respected, um, need to ensure that they honor the human rights of the people that they're protecting. So the professionalization of those services is incredibly important. The other thing that's very important is inclusive economic growth. So that communities in the north and on the border know that they're part of Ghana, know that the Ghanan, Ghanaian state cares about their well-being, that there are health services and security services, education services provided for them. So that if violent extremists come in and say, oh, you're poor, I'll take care of that, um, they say, well, no, thanks, I don't need that help because I, I, Mother Ghana uh, addresses that for me. And again, we don't want to do it for you, we want to help you to do it. So all of our USAID assistance is directed at those kinds of issues and services and the provision of those services in, in the North in particular. Uh, Madam Ambassador, the expectation is that when you have initiatives such as the Accra Initiative, uh, African countries should be jumping onto it. Uh, but we have, for instance, Nigeria, Mm. the biggest economy in the sub region, uh, just taking an observatory status in the Accra initiative. The feeling is that terrorism has not been securitized enough in the sub region. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think the President Akufuado said we have to deal with the sort of vi threat of violence first. But I think everybody who spoke at that conference acknowledged that we needed an integrated 360 degree approach. And again, Ghana, Ghana takes that that integrated approach, and I, I'm, I'm very um, admiring of that. Um, as for Nigeria, I think that's under discussion within the Accra Initiative. I'm not part of those discussions, and um, Nigeria being attentive to its own security issues as well as sub-regional ones is very important. I don't intend to dwell on, um, of course, the issue of t terrorism, mm. uh, but one more I issue like about, about uh, interventionism. Uh, w w there are claims that we're seeing an infiltration from both the West and the East, and there's some sort of a Cold War at play mm -hmm. uh, w when we see all of these military takeovers, uh, in the case of Mali, uh -huh. and uh, of course, just what's happening in Burkina Faso. Is the West or the East a part of the problem? You're being more diplomatic than I will be. I will be direct. Um, I think, you know, the Va Wagner is acting as a proxy for the Russian state, and I think that's dangerous. Um, for democracy and peace and security in the subregion, uh, and and beyond, frankly, um, I, guess, I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, it, it, w that's that's not a question of competition um, or a cold war. It's it's a question of a non-state actor acting on behalf of a foreign government, and and not really, I don't think, having the interest of those those countries at heart. There's a lot of exploitation of mineral resources and other things involved. Uh, human rights is one of the key factors underpinning uh, the principle of democracy. Uh, the U.S. State Department in 2021 uh, cited Ghana for some, um, of course, not very pleasant developments when it comes to human rights uh, and freedom of expression. So mm. uh, we'll break down the issues, but I'm a journalist, so mm. I should be concerned about free speech and the freedom of the press. Uh, you raised some concerns about how increasingly there are threats against journalists and unjustified arrests and prosecutions. How did the U.S. State Department uh, come to this conclusion and have you drawn the Ghanaian government's attention to this? The U.S. Human Rights Report, I, I'm a political officer so I've written many of those reports during my career and I view them as a helpful tool um, to people in government who say, oh look, 
this this is an issue of concern to the international community and so that good guys you know in government and outside of government have space to improve human rights and Ghana and the United States share common democratic values but both of us have room to improve um, so indeed I'm afraid that freedom of speech, which is a huge, important value to Ghana's success, um, has been under threat. You dropped something like 30, 30 places in the international ranking. Um, and so, uh, indeed, we have called attention of that um, to, the, to the government. And I've been happy to celebrate the success of Ghana's free press at things like the West Africa Journalist um, Association Awards and the Ghana um, Journalist Association Awards. Um, and let me say to you yeah, while we're right. sitting here um, how important what you do is to Ghana's democracy, um, to the transparency of the business environment. I think it, it's, it's just good for Ghana's economy and, and whole system. These findings were in 2021, mm -hmm. um, then and now. Do you see an improvement? I think there's more attention to the issue. Um, and there have, there have been arrests, though, of journalists for various things. And, and we track that very carefully and with concern. If we're to improve, which mm. areas should we be focused on as a nation? Well, I, I think, I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable position for, for politicians um, to have, to, to, to know that they're going to get called out um, by, by journalists. And I think everybody has to acknowledge that that's important to the whole process. And it's important to success, um, that things will get done better if people know that at the end of the day they're going to get examined for it. Let, let's get back to the reports uh, because it's not just about uh, freedom of, of expression, uh, but the thorny issue of LGBT rights mm. have also been, been captured. Uh, you, you raised um, some concerns about some, the existence of some laws criminalizing mm -hmm. um, same-sex uh, se sexual conducts uh, between adults. And you, you are asking our authorities to try and open up the space and be more tolerant to the issue of LGBTQ. But why should Ghanaians really worry when we have so much issues, mm. in fact, the economic recession and all of that on our tables to deal with? Well, I, I, let me start in a positive space. I think. One of the things that I so admired about Ghana before I came and have come to admire even more is a sort of culture of tolerance. You have religious tolerance. Um, the chief imam preaches about religious tolerance. Um, you have a lot of inter intermarriage. Um, you have a lot of ethnic tolerance. And, and that, again, has contributed to Ghana's long-term peace and stability. It's a, it's a Ghanaian value, I think. And the United States isn't asking for special rights for LGBTQ persons. We're asking that they receive the same rights that all other Ghanaians do. Um, I also want to be really clear that we're not kind of trying to promote homosexuality or anything like that. We're, we don't want your, your straight children to be gay. We want your gay children to be safe. And I think it's very important that, that the, any sort of threat on one group en encroaches on demonstrates that rights of other people can be encroached upon. And discrimination of any kind, frankly, is bad for the system. Um, in, in the case of this kind of discrimination, it will be bad for public order. We've already seen an uptick in violence against LGBT persons, which I think is terribly unfortunate. Um, it's bad for public health because people won't seek the kind of health care they need, for example, for HIV or monkeypox, if they think they're going to be stigmatized. That's bad not just for the LGBT community, but for everybody. Um, it could be bad for the Ghanaian economy, because there will be pressure from companies to say, oh, I can't headquarter in Ghana if my staff won't be safe, or if the rights of ordinary Ghanaians are not safe, or if people are not safe on the streets. It kind of sends out that signal. Um, and, and the issue of discrimination is one that, that I feel strongly about. I, I want to be really clear that homosexuality isn't a foreign import. There have been homosexuality in Africa for a very long time. There are cave paintings of homosexuals. But I, I wanted to bring that up uh, mm. to find out from you if it's not a cultural problem. Uh, because, for instance, you have an Afrobarometer report pointing mm. out that over 90% of Ghanaians do not even want to have, I mean, persons of LGBT orientation as their neighbors. Uh, mm. Why is the US government not acknowledging the cultural uh, challenge? Well, if I may, 
I am acknowledging the cultural challenge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish my thought, though, right. which is that homosexuality is not an import, but homophobia is an import. Homophobia was a Victorian colonial import. Um, and some of this debate, I feel like, is imported from outside. Um, and, and again, we're not asking for special rights for anybody. We're asking that Ghanaians receive that LGBT Ghanaians receive the same rights as, as other Ghanaians. Um, and I, I have made this personal. I'm not equating my situation, but I, I'm just, I've experienced, I haven't experienced, but I, my family has experienced discrimination. And I think Ghanaians and Africans and African Americans have all dis experienced discrimination. But when my husband and I were courting, um, at, he's South African, it was illegal in South Africa because n the Immorality Act um, made sort of miscegenation and interracial couples illegal. Right. And now, um, we've been married almost 40 years, but now people are like, oh, really? How could that ever have been illegal? People don't, it doesn't occur to people anymore that there was that kind of discrimination. Um, and I hope that someday we'll feel that way about women and children who are discriminated against, LGBT communities, minorities that are discriminated against. Discrimination is harmful. And it's harmful not just to the people who are discriminated against. It's harmful to everybody. I was talking about the cultural inhibition. So am I. Um, there were cultural inhibitions. I mean, the, the South African government, um, the apartheid government said, oh, God intended that the white man you know, be separate. That's what apartheid was. Um, and I think, I think God was invented for, you know, or invoked for a lot of colonial repression. So um, again, we're not, we're not commenting on the morality of this. We're just asking for um, people's rights to be respected, that they be left peaceful and free from harm. But unfortunately, what we have happening is that Ghana is tightening its laws that may, in terms of the implication, affect persons who have LGBTQ orientation. Mm. Uh, our Speaker of Parliament is assuring that uh, the mm. proper sexual rights and family values bill mm will be passed before 2024. It has implications for the LGBT community. I think it's a political hot potato. And I think in some ways it's being used as a political hot potato. Um, and what I'm saying is that I hope that Ghana, Ghana's citizens and Ghana's parliamentarians, Ghana's leaders will respect Ghana's constitution and its international obligations to which it's a signatory. But our laws do not permit for instance, the activities of LGBTQ persons. I think, I think a lot of people haven't read the bill as, as currently before committee. Um, and I, I think people should read the bill and be aware that it threatens, for example, radio journalists that would air a story about LGBT persons. Now, is that an encroachment on freedom of speech? Um, I, 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 I think we need to be careful that, that the space of Ghanaians isn't, isn't limited. Since you're passionate about this, Madam Ambassador, I'm interested in knowing what diplomatic measures you may take in dealing with this matter. Um, in February last year, President Biden issued a memo in relation to protecting LGBT rights and portions indicate that, quote, agencies engaged abroad shall consider appropriate responses, including the use of full range diplomatic and assistance tools and as appropriate financial sanctions and visa restrictions and other actions. Has Ghana crossed the line and are we likely to face some of these sanctions? Yeah, so you're pushing me hard on this. I've answered four times um, that, that we're not looking for special rights for LGBT people in, in Ghana. We're asking that their rights be respected under the Constitution and international human rights conventions to which Ghana is a signatory. Um, so I don't want to get hypothetical about other tools that are available. But I, I do also want to note that like, I'm doing it. Um, I'm answering your questions in good faith. And I'm also trying to be as humble as possible because I am a foreigner. And this is a Ghanaian cultural debate. It's also a constitutional debate. Um, and it's, one that, it's a conversation that Ghanaians must have. Um, have we crossed the line, Madam Ambassador? Again, I'm, I'm not going to get <laughs> hypothetical. Okay, with so let's talk about sanctions then. Uh, very recently, in terms of uh, visa restrictions, mm. uh, there was a uh, row between, I, I don't know if that's the way to qualify it, between the United States government and the government of Ghana. Have you resolved that and how are you going about it? Oh, that, that's been resolved since early 2020. 
and we're back to sort of normal operations in the visa section. We're trying to catch up on the visa backlog that was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm very relieved that when I arrived, the backlog was well over 400 days, which doesn't look welcoming, and we are welcoming. Um, so we've gotten that backlog for visitor visas and students down. Um, students can get a, an expedited appointment and get to class on time, and visitors, the, the wait to renew a visa is something like two weeks or four weeks, and to have an appointment for a new visa is 100 days or right thereabouts. Um, now we're going to work on immigrant visas. Are there some more reforms you're considering on that? Well, it's not a matter of reform. It's um, a matter of getting manpower out of Washington, frankly. Um, and I had taken everybody in the embassy with a consular commission. That's anybody who is familiar with the visa law um, and put them to work on the visa line. Uh, the U.S. government is also a key promoter of, uh, of course, climate adaptation because climate change is affecting all of us. Indeed. We're just returning from COP27. Uh, lots of pledges being made, and yet there's also the controversy about the loss and damage reparations. Mm. I'm sure that you followed the discourse. What's your take on what's happening? Well, I'm, I'm very pleased that the United States is back in the game and in a leadership role. And um, I, I also... I'm pleased that the, um, the, it's called the, what's it called, Reduction, Inflation Reduction Act, which is kind of a, a name that doesn't tell us much, but puts the resources necessary for the United States to reduce its emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030. So we're back where we should be um, in honoring our own obligations about the climate. Um, there's also a lot of money in that bill for clean energy programs that will be helpful internationally, I think. And at COP, we announced the doubling of our contribution to the Adaptation Fund, which will provide sort of drought ins uh, insurance and crop techniques, cropping techniques, and climate adaptation um, programs um, for, for the globe. Um, 17 of the 20 most vulnerable countries um, to climate change are in Africa, so that's very important to Africa. Given the economic crisis, uh, many countries are beginning to shift their nationally determined contribution. Mm -hmm. um, they're changing priorities and spending more in some other areas. How do we keep countries on track in achieving the Paris Agreement? Secretary Kerry, who's our former Secretary of State and now our global presidential envoy for the, for the climate, um, has said, you know, if a meteor were coming at us, we wouldn't be standing around with our hands in our pockets saying who's responsible, who has to pay. We'd be sort of rolling up our sleeves and cooperating to get the, the earth out of the way of the meteor. And indeed, climate change is such a meteor coming right at us. So we all need to be ambitious about our nationally determined contributions. And I'm, again, pleased to be able to look you in the eye and say the United States is going to meet ours. Um, and we're working with some of the biggest emitters to ensure that they do the same thing. Um, and I, I believe that it's in the interest of African countries to do the same. I'll speak, if I may, about clean energy, because a lot of Africans, I worked on energy before I came to Ghana, a lot of Africans said, of course we want clean energy, but we don't want to think about it in the dark. And that's a perfectly reasonable attitude to take. So I think when we talk about energy, we need to balance three things. One is energy access, um, sort of for development, so people having power um, and being able to afford it. One is energy security, so that the Russians, for example, can't use it as a Damoclean sword over everybody's head for political gain. And then the third is climate and clean energy. And I feel like that's an African stool. All three of those things need to be balanced. Um, but if you, ha if you drop one leg off, if you don't pay attention to climate, the stool won't be stable. Let's wrap up our conversation with COVID-19. Mm. It appears we're getting out of the woods, but there are lessons to be learned. And we need to also cooperate some more for me personally, that's one of the uh, lessons mm. we, we must pick up, yeah. that we need to increase cooperation uh, between countries. How is the U.S. government working closely with countries such as Ghana um, to pick up the lessons and to be resilient going forward? Thanks, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm proud of the work that the United States did with Ghana on COVID-19. Again, the government's response on COVID-19 was admirable. Um, and yesterday I was in WA, 
and visited a medical stores um, where we helped pay for the refrigerators, for example, and freezers to keep those vaccines safe until they were distributed to health centers. Um, the United States, I, I believe, donated something like 61 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccination um, and did a lot of work to strengthen the health system so that our response both to COVID-19 and to future pandemics will be strong. So that includes things like emergency health care center, not health care centers, emergency response centers. There are four. Um, one just opened in Ho. It includes things like um, improvement in the national labs. And we saw like great work from the national labs in dealing with Marburg and monkeypox in just recent months. And again, Ghana's response on that is to be commended. So um, I think cooperation in public health between our two countries is excellent. I think it'll go from strength to strength. Are we to expect more? Yes. Okay. And uh, we're wrapping up back at where we started off from, the U.S.-Africa Summit. Mm. If there's anything that the Ghanaian public needs to know about this upcoming summit and why it's so important for nations such as Ghana, what would be your special message to Ghanaians out there? Well, thanks. I'll just give a, a, a little bit of background on what it includes. Um, there's a youth and diaspora summit and President Akufo Otto is going to play a, a big role in that. Um, and again, that sort of year of return and the role of the diaspora in both countries I think is very important. There's a, a, a function on peace and security and West African security will be important to that. On the second day, there's a business, a whole business day and there will be deals that um, feature in that. Um, there are some companies with U.S. Ghanaia links. Um, Tech Gulf, I, I opened their call center a couple of days ago. Um, that's creating jobs in both Ghana and the United States and is really to be celebrated. Niche Coco, um, which does a lot of cocoa manufacturing here, um, opened a chocolate factory in Wisconsin recently. So we'll export cocoa under a Goa and then combine it with milk in Wisconsin, which is famous for its dairy, and that creates jobs in both Ghana and the United States. Um, and then the third day is the actual summit. Um, and again, Ghana is very important. So I know uh, President Akufuata will have important things to say at that summit. And I see that you're excited about it. But, I am. Uh, that's all time would allow us. Ambassador Virginia Palmer, thank you for talking to join us. Thank you very much.